Okay, guys, we're back to the second part of this uh, economic data uh, video series. It's the two video, two video video series. In the first uh, video, which I'll link to here, we covered earnings, uh, we covered uh, CPI and PPI, we looked at retail sales and consumer sentiment as well as GDP. And just as a quick recap, uh, obviously we have earnings season uh, or, or you know the time when companies report their earnings um, four times a year, right? So it's, it's split up according to how many quarters there are in the year. And of course, there are four quarters. Um, CPI is reported uh, differently and monthly, but it is sometimes compared monthly and it's sometimes compared quarterly as well as yearly. So you have to be careful when you're comparing numbers because a lot of times people get tripped up. Um, uh, about CPI uh, on a month-to-month -month basis, which is a much smaller number, obviously, uh, compared to on a, a quarterly or, more importantly, on a yearly basis. And then uh, retail sales, well, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty straightforward, I believe, as well as consumer sentiment, right? So if consumer, the consumer is feeling good, and remember, the U.S. economy is uh, very uh, consumer-based, right, as a difference... Uh, as compared to the Chinese economy, for example, which is more manufacturing based. Um, so as consumer, consumer sentiment goes up, excuse me, then obviously that means that uh, people are more willing to spend. And of course, that gets reflected as well in the retail sales. Uh, and there are certain retail um, beacons or benchmarks, if you will, which are, you know, the big retailers. <clears throat> And then there's GDP, which was a little bit more complicated, also reported on a yearly, monthly, and quarterly basis. Again, like the CPI, you have to be careful. Make sure that you are comparing uh, month to month or quarter to quarter or year to year because the numbers vary. Obviously, uh, a US GDP number yearly growth, um, or which is basically the yearly growth, GDP growth of a country who is um, you know, in a growth and expansion phase uh, or a very healthy uh, economy is usually around five, six percent. We saw China, you know, going nuts around nine, ten, I believe, even eleven percent at some point. Uh, but that was in their uh, exponential growth phase a uh, couple of years ago, I think. Uh, but now they're down to five or six. Of course, they're in a recession, and uh, U.S. is uh, somewhere around four or five percent. So uh, make sure that's on a yearly basis, right? If you compare it on a quarterly basis, that number is going to be smaller. So again, like the CPI, be careful what you are comparing so you don't get uh, tripped up on uh, monthly or yearly uh, comparisons. And today we're going to cover a job, uh, basically the labor market uh, as seen by a few indicators, jobless claims, ADP, and payrolls. Uh, we're going to look at the dollar, which I have no idea why. I think this was just a typo in the previous... Uh, uh, video that I made. I'm not that familiar with Keynote, so I, I won't waste time trying to figure out how to, I believe it's format style. Hmm. No, I don't know where it is. Here we go. This should be it. Yep. There we go. Dollar. We're going to look at the labor market, the dollar, which is very related to yields and oil, and we're going to look at mortgage apps. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, jobless claims. Let's switch over to uh, tradingeconomics.com, which is the calendar that I used in the first part, in the first video. And uh, as mentioned, there is the actual, the previous consensus and forecast. So the forecast is whatever was forecast to happen. Um, and then the previous is the previous either month or year. And as I mentioned, you know, when you are comparing, make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. If you're comparing aver average hourly earnings, uh, make sure that you're looking at month on month or year on year. Right or quarter on quarter, okay, and that same the same goes for GDP, for example. So here we have a GDP uh, quarter on quarter, okay. So GDP quarter on quarter, for example, and this is for Canada, um, was the previous was 0.6 percent, and the forecast was 0.1 percent. So as you can see, that's a much smaller number because that is quarter on quarter. If you were to look at the GDP uh, month to month, it would be much larger. I mean, sorry year to year, it would be a much larger number. And if you look at it month to month, it's also much smaller. So it makes sense, right? Okay, so Friday, which is today, September 1st, is right here, okay? And so you go through and you look at the little flags here and you pick the ones that you are interested in 
in case that you're only looking at U.S. Uh, the, the U.S. markets or your U.S. economy, then this is what you want to look at. So uh, there's three data points that are reported that are rela related to the labor market. Um, the first one is non-farm payrolls. The second one is unemployment rate. And the third one is uh, payrolls. Well, that's the, the private one. But, um, well, the third one is actually average hourly earnings or um, that has to do with, you know, inflation in the labor market per se. So how much did hourly earnings go up or down in that case? Uh, so let's go ahead and look at the, basically these two, which are the prob probably the most looked at. The unemployment rate means what percentage of the active labor, active labor force is actually um, unemployed. Um, we have a definition here from investing.com. So the unemployment rate, as I mentioned, measures the percentage of total workforce that is unemployed and actively actively seeking. Okay, so this is there's the there's the universe of the population of the United States, and then out of that population, there are um, a f quite a few people who are not part of the workforce, which means that they are not um, part of the active workforce, such as I. Uh, don't know the exact, you know, uh, uh, politics or thresholds in the U.S. economy, but obviously younger people, uh, kids, are not going to be considered part of the labor force. So in the U.S., it might be either uh, below 18 or below 21. You're not considered part of the uh, active labor force. And again, after retirement, after a certain age, you're also not considered part of the active labor force. Of course, it wouldn't make sense to count those people as unemployed because it, it would inflate the unemployment rate, right? So basically, on both ends of the curve, you chop off um, the people who wouldn't normally be employed, and the rest is considered the total workforce or the active labor force. So uh, we have a chart here for, I believe it's five years, yeah? Okay, so you can see here in 2020, um, obviously there was a, uh, a big jump in unemployment. This is the unemployment rate. Uh, which has been successfully brought back down to more normal levels. So this makes uh, should make a lot of sense because it means that uh, 14, 15, 16 percent of the labor force was unemployed, right? Because there were a lot of lo jobs lost after the pandemic <clears throat> uh, and and during the pandemic, and then after the pandemic was basically you know in, under some sort of control, right? Then we started to see people uh, get, going back, getting hired, and the, unemp the unemployment rate uh, going down, as you can clearly see on this chart. The, uh, the amount of jobless claims uh, is usually reported as the number of people who claimed un uh, un unemployment insurance for the first time. So it is obviously directly related to the unemployment rate because if unemployment claims go up, then that means that the unemployment rate itself will obviously go up as well. Okay, so this is the number of unemployment claims uh, filed uh, on a monthly basis, and this is about it's usually around 180, maybe 200,000, 150,000 a month. As you can see, qu quite the big jump up uh, right on March 2020. You can see that there were three million, and then almost seven million on a monthly basis as compared to 200 or 300,000 on a monthly basis before the pandemic. And then it has slowly uh, dropped back down. And this is only up to 2020. It is a lot better now. Let me see if we can uh, find it here. The unemployment claims. Okay, not here. Maybe it's on a different day. So that is the difference between the unemployment rate and the initial jobless claims, as it is sometimes called, or the jobless claims, which is people claiming unemployment insurance because they have lost their job. Okay, They are indirectly related, but they are indeed related. And then there's the payrolls number. The payrolls number is the number of jobs added. Okay, uh, And then and there's non-farm payrolls, right? Come back over here. There's non-farm payrolls, which is basically everybody that is not a farm, you know, uh, directly or indirectly employed farm workers. So you have goods and service companies um, all reporting. And then you have, uh, you know, if you want to look at a little bit more specific uh, or finer details, you have actual government payrolls, which is the public sector, right? So all, obviously all of those indicators have to do with the labor market and they can be very powerful in moving markets because 
remember the Federal Reserve's uh, double uh, mandate, as it is called, is to control prices. Basically, they have to maintain price stability in the market, in the economy. So they have to control prices, make sure that prices don't go out of whack, um, either to the upside or to the downside is obviously a bad thing. So they control basically inflation which is why CPI and PPI are so important. But the second mandate of the Federal Reserve is to actually um, maintain uh, a healthy labor market, right? So you, ha uh, you have them always looking out f for the employment rate or the unemployment rate, actually. And um, unfortunately, that sometimes means that they have to do something to cool the economy by making sure that... Uh, you know, companies don't grow as much or don't increase their prices as much, which means that that sometimes affects the labor force and it increases the unemployment rate. So you can find videos of Fed Powell and other feds in the past, you know, talking to Congress or the Senate about how uh, it's it sounds like a horrible thing that one of their mandates is to actually control the employment rate, right? Uh, and if there's too much employment, that's going to drive drive uh, labor prices up, which is going to drive, um, uh, which is going to be problematic because it's going to drive goods and services prices up, which is going to affect the economy in a negative way. So that is the relevance of jobless claims and the ADP. Uh, the ADP uh, uh, payrolls is the private payrolls. Uh, the dollar. Okay, let's uh, jump over to the dollar and let me see if I can find, I think, Finance Yahoo.com. Yeah, this might work. Um, you'll usually find it as a ticker symbol DXY, right? And what it does is it, uh, but sometimes you have to add the dollar sign in front of it just to make sure. And it depends. Let me see. Okay, not on Yahoo Finance. That's something else. Uh, so let's try DXY. Uh, no, so let's just try a dollar index, okay? But basically that is what it is. It's the dollar index. Here it is, the dollar index cash. And here it is, right? So this is one day. Let me jump back to five years and then we'll take a look at the, yeah, the logic. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so what is the logic behind this? So the dollar was, you know, basically just, you know, uh, trading along uh, 18, 19, 20, and in the, in the 2020, which is right around here. See, yeah, this is 19. This is March 20 right here. As you can see, it drops. Why does the dollar drop on the pandemic? Well, the dollar is actually just another product. And if uh, trading is going to be halted and uh, you know, international trade is halted and economies are basically uh, ground to a halt because of this pandemic, then there's a lot less trading. If there's a lot less trading, that means that a lot less company or countries need dollars because they don't need to pay for their dollar for their U.S. imports by using dollars. So this is something. Uh, it's actually quite simple. But if you there's two countries and they are, they trade, if they like, like U.S. and China, they trade, which means U.S. exports to China and China exports to the U.S. So China is basically buying dollars in order to pay for whatever they buy from the U.S. And by the same token, the U.S. has to buy uh, yuan in order to buy Chinese goods. Well, the U.S. dollar is one of the most widely traded currencies because the U.S. exports so much that a lot of countries need to buy dollars in order to buy things from the U.S., so every time there's a lot of um, U.S. exports, sorry, yeah, if there are a lot of US, U.S. exports, then a lot of com countries are going to be wanting to buy the dollar, right, in order to pay for U.S. goods. But if the U.S. economy stops exporting because of the pandemic, for example, then there's not that much trade going on where countries are buying U.S. dollars in order to pay for U.S. goods. So the value of the dollar drops. When those economies are reactivated, then it rockets back up because a lot of com countries are now uh, scrambling to buy dollars to buy the U.S. goods that they now need because they're 
economies are now back uh, or they have reopened, right? And then the U.S. dollar has an extra added weight to this uh, because not only do they trade, you know, not only not only is international trade uh, handled, uh, uh, well, U.S. exports handled in dollars, but also uh, U.S., I mean, uh, oil, international oil trade is in dollars, okay, because of an agreement, you know, made, made a long time ago, <clears throat> which is kind of falling apart now, uh, that all oil be traded in dollars in certain, you know, certain uh, oil producing countries which are the biggest oil producing countries of course that is kind of falling apart with the BRICS, if you've heard of it and um but uh after it rocketed back up you can see now clearly that back in 2023 or now in 2023 that dollar has began to stabilize right now here's the thing dollar is important because when it goes up right when the dollar goes up that means that the dollar is very strong and if it is very strong, then it also it usually reflects the strength of the economy as well. If the economy is doing good, that usually means that a lot of uh, countries and foreign companies are going to want to buy dollars, not just for buying goods from the U.S., but also to invest. And what is what are some of the, some of the you know three of the top investment vehicles you know, in any country the stock market of that country the bond market of that country and the real estate market of that com com uh, country so out of those three the most stable is the bond market right the sovereign bonds or the government bonds are considered the safest. Why? Because stocks in a stock market can go up and down. They, companies can go bankrupt, right? Um, uh, real estate can go up and down and crash, as we have clearly seen in the past, in the recent past. So out of those, the government-backed securities are the ones that are the safest. And they're sought out quite a bit by a lot of not just um, uh, foreign companies, but also foreign countries. They buy each other's debt. China owns a whole bunch of U.S. debt uh, through bonds that they buy, right? And the reason they buy bonds is because when you buy a bond, you give that company money and that money pays you, you know, monthly, yearly, whatever interest rates back for having given them that amount of money um, in, in a bond. A bond is basically a loan. So because the... Uh, the dollar is used for trade, then obviously it gets driven up. Because the dollar is used for oil trade, the dollar gets driven up. And when it does, it means, it has, it should mean that the country's economy is quite strong, which means that companies in other countries and other countries themselves are going to want to buy debt in that country because their, their economy is doing good. That means that they're solid on their, you know, their, their forecast, and it means that they will not default on their payments. So government debt becomes very attractive as uh, the most attractive out of those three investment vehicles. So when the dollar goes up, stocks go, go down, which is what you'll hear very often. And the reason is, would you rather invest in a stock that might or might not give you 10, 15, 20 percent? Or would you rather invest on in a company in a country, sorry, that is giving you basically risk-free debt because there is no risk of it collapsing, there is no risk of their of the country defaulting on their payments, but they're giving you five, six, seven percent return. Well, obviously a seven seven percent return, which is also risk-free, is is very you know very attractive compared to a twenty percent return, which might or might not be there. You know, it might be there. It might go negative. You don't really know. So um, when the dollar goes up, right, then equities look less attractive, which is that's basically what happens. They look less attractive and therefore they uh, the stocks go down, right, because people pull money out of the stock market and they stick it into bonds. Um, and that is, again, also related to yields, right? So what do, what are yields? These are basically... Uh, government uh, bond yields, okay? And think about this. If you have a government bond, which is paying 
7%, then a lot of people are going to want to buy it, right? And the thing is, if yields go up, then the value of the bond goes down. If yields go down, again, the value of the bond goes up. They are inversely related, right? So if yields are going up, then that is making bonds very, very attractive to, uh, to investors. So as yields go up, they would rather invest in bonds, right, than invest in, um, in equities. Because yields, these are bond yields, just to clear up. Oops, these are bond yields. There. So as bond yields go up, then investors would much rather put their money on a safer investment, such as government bonds, than put their money into the stock market or equities. So uh, that is basically dollar and yields going up is bad for stocks, right? And so you'll see that. And you'll usually, when you're trading, you should keep an eye on the dollar index and you should keep an eye on certain things such as um, the TNX, for example, the 10-year uh, government yield. And there's, you know, there's the two-year, there's the 30-year, and there's... Many, many other ones, but the two, the five, the 10, and the 30 are probably the, the, the ones most looked at. And out of those, the 10 is probably one of the more looked at ones. Um, okay, and then uh, oil, of course, you know, the thing with oil is as oil goes up, then it makes it more expensive to, uh, to run the economy because, you know, companies are obviously affected by oil, and as oil goes up, it means that, oops, five years, right? So here it drops because the economies come to a stall. They stall, you know, they come to a halt. So, you know, people aren't buying oil. And then as soon as the recovery, you know, starts back up again, then the price of oil goes back up, right? And now we've stabilized and we don't know what oil is going to be doing. Obviously, the economies of different countries are not the only thing that drive oil prices. There's also... Um, production cuts. So when they cut production rates, then obviously oil becomes more scarce and therefore the prices go up. When a recession uh, is, is looming, then the prices of oil go down. When there's a war, the prices of oil uh, jump because uh, a, uh, there's a forecast scarcity of oil in the market uh, in the futures to come. And, and the last one is mortgage apps. And I believe that they have, uh, I think they reported this. Uh, so what does mortgages have to do with, I think this is only for Friday, which is, oh, okay, it's not giving me the previous days because uh, they already passed. Let me see. I think I can still get it if I just say this week. There we go. Okay, so there's, yeah. So mortgage apps was somewhere in here. Here you can see the, the auctions, right, the five-year uh, note auction or, or government bond auction. Uh, here you can see uh, housing prices, which is obviously important. Um, the the jolts, the, uh, the the stocks, the U.S. oil stocks are important. You know because if oil stocks go up or down, the reserves go up or down, then it's obviously uh, cause for concern. Oh well, actually, if it goes down. Um, and here are the mortgage apps. So here are the, the mortgage refinance index. So bas basically what this is telling us is that, um, you know, this one in particular, the mortgage rate is telling us what the mortgage rate is, which is incredibly high now. It's 7.31. I think I heard somebody on Discord the other day typing, uh, or, or her, I read him typing that he works for a <clears throat> mortgage company and they have seen uh, as high as 8% recently in the past week of August. So the last week of August. So, you know, there you go. But then you also have uh, mortgage apps, the mortgage applicants, how many people applied for, you know, uh, for mortgages. And that obviously has to do with uh, the state of the economy, because if, you know, you have seven or 8% mortgage rates, then obviously mortgage apps are not going to be high. They're going to be low. They're going to be negative. They're going to go down. Um, and, um, uh, and, and that, that kind of gives you an idea of what's going on in that third uh, investment uh, market that I talked to you about, the real estate market, because um, it, as mortgage apps go up, it means that, you know, the state of the, consu the, the, state of the consumer is positive. You know, you should see positive consumer sentiment or inc increasing 
or improving cons uh, consumer sentiment. Whereas if you see mortgage apps go down, it means that the consumer is so tight that they're not buying any homes. And um, that is, you know, generally bad for the overall economy, because if the consumer is so bad off that it can't even buy a home, uh, you know, it'd be a different story if we're talking about discretionary items like, you know, a car or, uh, you know, luxury items. But if you're not even able to buy a home, then that's, uh, you know, that's a pretty telling sign that the economy is not doing very well. So uh, those are, in a nutshell, the 10 most important econ macroeconomic indicators that uh, we usually look out for when we're trading. And to tie this back into the whole Think Script video series that we're looking at, at over here, this kind of information is information that you can have pop up. If you're using the Thinkorswim platform, you can have it pop up and we, we're learning how to code these things. We're learning how to code uh, scripts that give us information in a column form, scripts that give us information on a chart, scripts that give us information on some sort of a grid layout or a study that's underneath charts. And um, speci especially on charts, this is the kind of data which is very helpful because if you're looking, if you're trading Tesla, then you're probably going to want to look at uh, something like, uh, let me see, uh, well, yeah, the DXY uh, or GDP in general or consumer sentiment would probably be one of, the, you know, a very important one. But you would probably want to look out, for example, for CPI uh, auto and cars specifically. You know, uh, if you're trading Walmart, then you'll probably want to look at retail sales and consumer sentiment. If you're trading uh, oil, I don't know if any of you trade oil, but if you're looking at trading oil or, or retail or some of the more like consumer staples, you probably want to look at GDP. Uh, but th these are pieces of information that can sh uh, show up on any chart. So such as if you're trading, you know, a particular ticker that is related to the real estate market, the oil market, you know, the dollar, the yields, uh, you know, or particular earnings uh, report, you know, the EPS, the previous EPS. We have an EPS, uh, historic EPS script or uh, think script coming up in one of the future videos. Then you want to make sure that you're able to see, uh, you know, these uh, these uh, these data points on your chart as you're trading, you know, because it keeps you up to date. It keeps you informed. So um, I hope you, uh, you know, that this sort of very quick and uh, rough explanation of this, these economic indicators was clear enough. If it wasn't, please go ahead and drop comments. Uh, I will answer all your questions. And um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And don't forget to use my invite link if you're going to get an X-Crades, X -Crades, uh community membership uh, to sign up for the signals on Discord or on our web app. Uh, we also have the web, the mobile app as well. So don't forget to use my invite link, which is in the comments of every video that I post. If you use that, I will get points on X Trades, but you will get a uh, personal free video guided tour that I can take you on uh, remotely, obviously, of the Discord, of the web app, and the mobile app as well, and how to use it. I will also share all of my video resources and all of my presentations with you, so that you can have uh, as much information as you possibly can digest. All right, so I hope you have a great trading week next week and see you next time.